Hello class, welcome back. Uh, starting from this video, we're gonna tackle the most difficult concept in midterm one, that is accounting for long-term contracts. Now it is difficult, not because it's intellectually challenging. Uh, in other words, it's really hard to understand. No, it is difficult because it just have many steps in order to come up to the final answer. So what we're gonna do is to separate it into a, um, several videos. In this video, we're gonna talk about the concept. In the next video, we purely talk about how to calculate the numbers. And then we will do some exercise to reinforce the understanding. Next, we're gonna talk about how many accounts are involved and how to do the journal entry. Now, long-term contracts or long-term transactions, well, basically it means the accounting period is too short to include uh, the complete business cycle. So think about a business cycle for McDonald's and for Boeing. A business cycle for McDonald's is when I, as a customer, order from uh, McDonald's and it takes them several minutes to prepare the food and then they deliver me the food. That is one transaction. For Boeing, they manufacture airplanes and one airplane takes years to finish. So the business cycle is like several years, but accounting period for both firms are quarterly or annually. So um, for Boeing, their accounting period is too short to include a manufacturing uh, airplane cycle. So these transactions have two features. Number one, they represent large projects, right? Because it takes years, a long time to complete. Usually these are large projects and uh, they also represent huge uh, dollar amounts for each project. And uh, so usually a company uh, may be involved in uh, quite a small amount of such projects. For example, Boeing, in a given year, they may have contracts with Delta, they may also have contracts with Air France, or even say um, the, uh, you know, for example, uh, Korean Air. So, se so several these such projects, and all of them are long term. The second feature is that turnout, these long-term transactions are quite common. In a recent survey about, uh, of the largest 600 US firms, about 20% of them indicated that they have long-term uh, sales transactions. So it is not limited to you know, these tra traditional manufacturing firms like Boeing or like the um, you know, ship or uh, military uh, related uh, companies. Also, sometimes the softwares and uh, consulting company, they have these long-term projects. Think about Accenture developing a software tailored to the, uh, a certain customer, right? It takes years to develop this software. Now, how about the accounting for these long-term contracts? Uh, for the revenue recognition part, remember the previous videos is about uh, step one to five to apply the revenue recognition. Now, in long-term contracts, step two and five are kind of uh, critical. Step two is to identify performance obligations. What are performance obligations? Well, they're basically promises. So, well, how about long-term contracts? Seems like we have to, uh, as the uh, you know, uh, manufacturers, we have to put in a lot of things and say manufacturing a factory for a client. We need to put in carpet, concrete, bricks, and human labors. Well, they are quite distinguishable from each other. Are they treated as several long-term, uh, sorry, several performance obligations? Turn out uh, we have a specific rule for these long-term uh, contracts. Uh, you know, they usually have only one single performance obligation. Why is it? Think about the contract. Uh, the contract is to deliver a factory to the client. It's not deliver a certain amount of carpets, certain amount of bricks, 
No, you have to combine them to make a factory. So these、uh, carpets or you know bricks, they are not separately identifiable. That is why we treat the long-term contracts usually one single performance obligation. Now, step five is to recognize revenue when, right? And you know we talk about a lot of rules in the previous video, and they are quite confusing. I think so too. Ah,、uh, but the title is not confusing. The title says recognize revenue when each performance obligation is satisfied. Wait. Now that we only have one performance obligation for long-term contracts, you know, we just said it in the previous paragraph. Does it mean that we have to wait until the factory is completed in order to recognize revenue? In other words, if、uh, it takes five years to manufacture a factory, does it mean that the first four years revenue is zero, and then the fifth year the revenue is boom? You know, or the total revenue? We also have specific rules about these.、Uh, basically, we have two methods.、Uh, the second one is to wait until the contract is completed. What we just discussed: zero for the first four years, and then boom, you have a revenue in the fifth year. The second one is to recognize it over time,、uh, and it is according to the progress toward completion. You know, have you made certain amount of progress? Uh, if you do, then the first year I'm gonna recognize you according to the progress you made, and oftentimes long-term contract qualify to be recognized over time. Wait, let me ask you a quick question: If you are the manager, do you prefer to recognize revenue over time, or do you prefer to wait? Well, of course, I want to recognize revenue as soon as possible, right? And、uh, you know, over time. Recognizing also means my income is smooth. So in the new rule,、um, the criteria to kind of separate these two methods is basically: can the progress be measured reliably? If it can, then we're gonna use、uh, overtime recognition, and the method or the approach is percentage of completion. Is proportion to the、uh, percentage of how much you have completed.、Uh, income will be recorded after you complete several phases. Sometimes in the contract, you will specify the steps of phases, and then after you finish each step, you can recognize revenue.、Uh, if the progress cannot be measured reliably, then we cannot recognize revenue over time. We have to wait until、um, the you know product or the building or the ship is delivered to the customer. We can recognize the、uh, cost as well as the revenue. Now、uh, we're gonna focus on the first one,、uh, which is percentage of completion method. This approach is very commonly used. Uh, and it requires the company to be able to estimate number one, total cost, total revenue, and then you have to measure the progress. Why is it? Well, you gotta have a concrete number you have to, to estimate. Otherwise, how do I calculate the percentage of them? Right? Even if I know that I have finished thirty、uh, percent, so you know how much is the total cost? I have to times thirty percent by something. So you need to get the concrete number for cost as well as revenue, and then you have to measure whether it's thirty percent, forty percent, or thirty-five percent.、Uh, conceptually, the method recognizes the economic substance of a transaction by allocating revenue to periods of performance of the work, so that the revenue is recognized as it is earned. Uh, well, then how do we measure the progress? How do we measure the thirty percent or forty percent? We're gonna base this percentage on cost.、Uh, think about it. If we have, say, if we we estimate that the total cost to manufacture a factory is one million dollars, then once we I used up, say, three hundred thousand dollars in year one, then I'm gonna use thirty percent, right, of the cost. And my revenue should also be proportioned to the cost, so I'm gonna recognize thirty percent of the revenue. 
So this is the, you know, the method to measure the progress. And in the next video, we're going to get down to numbers. I'm going to use a mini example to demonstrate the point, the calculation. I'll see you in the next video.